Thank you, Mr. Miller. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to begin by thanking Mr. Chance for that sermonette, because that was a perfect introduction to the sermon today. Have you ever been a victim? Have you ever been victimized? Have you ever victimized someone else? The Random House College Dictionary defines a victim this way. He is a person who suffers from a destructive or injurious action. My family and I were victimized 15 years ago. Our house was burglarized. I came home from work late one afternoon. I knew the house would be empty because Sherry and both our daughters were at Camp Buckeye. As I pulled up to the house, I saw the door standing open. Someone had broken into our home. The burglar stole a computer, not a whole lot more, but he had broken down, damaged two doors and a window screen, left us some repair work to be done. This was the end of July. Two months later, we had left already and were journeying to the Feast of Tabernacles. He came back. He broke down another door, but this time he stole a lot more. He stole jewelry, not the Hope Diamond, but a lot of very sentimental, valued jewelry. He stole one of my girls' piggy bank. Now a relative said to me afterward, afterwards to me, Scott, there must be a special level in hell for anyone who would steal a child's piggy bank. She's not in God's church. She doesn't really understand heaven and hell the way we do, but the sentiment was understood and appreciated. He also stole my daughter's pressed penny collection. Do you know about pressed pennies? They have these machines scattered around in tourist locations. You put in a penny and used to be 50 cents, now it's more like a dollar, and then you turn this crank and it presses the penny into a souvenir from the place that you've visited. My girls probably had between two and 300 of these from all over the country. Great souvenirs on feast trips and things like that. You've got second tithe in your pocket, so you can come up with you know, some pennies and a few quarters pretty easily. They loved those pennies, played with them a lot. He took them. They were gone. The sheriff caught him. They sentenced him to jail, to prison, four years. Six months later, I got notification he was being released. I spoke with the judge. He said, the prisons are just bulging. We have to release a lot of these prisoners. And he also said, well, the burglar, the bad guy, had stayed clean off of drugs for those six months. I thought, what an accomplishment that much must be. If he's sitting in a jail cell and he's passing drug tests, oh. I remember, though, at the hearing, as this man was being released, the judge told him, you have changed these people's lives forever. Every time they leave their home, they're going to look back. They're going to run through questions in their mind. Did I lock the doors? Did I close all the windows? Am I sure? And he was right, because we do. We always try to make sure that we've done all the things that we need to to ensure safety, because we know these things can happen. Our lives have been changed. We were victimized. We suffered from destructive and unlawful actions of this, this intruder, this burglar, this bad guy. You can see why I appreciated Mr. Chance's sermonette. 
Well, today, I'd like to discuss this matter of victims, and I'd like to look at some examples from God's Word. For those of you who, like an SPS, you spokesman, or a title, this is what I've called this. God remembers victims. God remembers victims. We're going to examine several examples. Let's begin with the Bible's chief example of a victim, and that's Jesus Christ. Many places we could turn, but let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to read verses 21 to 24. 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 21. For to this you were called, because Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. This is a passage, passage we often review as Passover approaches. Clearly, truly, Jesus is our perfect Passover sacrifice. He suffered, not for himself, but for us. He didn't threaten those who beat him and ultimately killed him. He committed no sin. He didn't deserve what he received. There was no deceit found in his mouth. And when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. He bore our sins on the stake. This was for our benefit, brethren. In verse 23, we were reminded that Jesus himself, Jesus committed himself to the righteous judge, his Father, God Almighty. And we were told at the beginning in verse 21, this is to be an example to all of us, that we too need to rely upon our Heavenly Father, because God will not forget the victims. God did not forget Jesus Christ. He didn't leave Jesus in the grave. He resurrected him to the great position he holds today. Well, as I said, that's the natural place to start. And you may be thinking, well, sure, Jesus was God in the flesh. But what about me? I'm flesh in flesh. Well, let's read about some other examples in God's word of people who were men, women, just like us. Let's begin in 1 Kings chapter 21. 1 Kings chapter 21. We're going to read the example of Naboth a man who owned a vineyard. In 1 Kings 21, starting in verse 1, It came to pass after these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard which was in Jezreel, next to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. So Ahab spoke to Naboth, saying, Give me your vineyard that I may have it for a vegetable garden, because it is near next to my house and for it well, I will give you a vineyard better than it, or if it seems good to you, I will give you its worth in money. But Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid that I should give the inheritance of my fathers to you. Naboth said, I don't want to sell. Verse 4, So Ahab went to his house sullen and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And he lay down on his bed and turned away his face and would eat no food. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said to him, Why is your spirit so sullen that you eat no food? He said, Because I spoke to Naboth the Jezreelite and said to him, Give me your vineyard for money, or else if it pleases you, I will give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. Then Jezebel, his wife, said to him, You now exercise authority over Israel. 
Arise, eat food, let your heart be cheerful, and I will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. And she wrote letters in Ahab's name, sealed them with his seal, and sent the letters to the elders and nobles who were dwelling in the city with Naboth. She wrote in the letters, saying, Proclaim a fast, seat Naboth with high honor among the people, and seat two men, scoundrels, before him to bear witness against him, saying, You have blasphemed God and the king. Then take him out and stone him that he may die. And that's exactly what happened. Verse 11, So the men of his city, the elders and nobles who were inhabitants of the city, did as Jezebel Jezebel had sent to them, as it was written in the letters which she had sent. They proclaimed a fast and seated Naboth in high honor among the people. And two men, scoundrels, came in and sat before him, and the scoundrels witnessed against him, against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth has blasphemed God and the king. Then they took him outside the city and stoned him with stones, so that he died. Then they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth has been stoned and is dead. It came to pass, when Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned and was dead, Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give you for money, for Naboth is not alive but dead. So it was, when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, Ahab got up and went down to take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So Ahab gets the vineyard. Verse 17, Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who lives in Samaria. There he is in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone down to take possession of it. You shall speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, Have you murdered and also taken possession? And you shall speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, In the place where dogs licked the blood of Naboth, Dogs shall lick your blood, even yours. So God took notice of what had happened to this victim. It did not go unnoticed. Continuing, Ahab said to Elijah, Have you found me, O my enemy? And he answered, I have found you because you have sold yourself to do evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring calamity on you. I will take away your posterity. I will cut off from Ahab every male in Israel, both bond and free. I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and the house of Basha, the son of Ahijah, because of the provocation with which you have provoked me to anger and made Israel sin. And concerning Jezebel, the Lord also spoke, saying, The dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. The dogs shall eat whoever belongs to Ahab and dies in the city, and the birds of the air shall eat whoever dies in the field. So God pronounced judgment against Ahab for the evil that he had done. God remembered the victim, and that was Naboth. Let's look at another example. For this one, let's turn back to 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11. This is the story of David's adulterous affair with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband, Uriah. 2 Samuel chapter 11. It happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said, Is this not Bathsheba? the daughter of Eliam, 
the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers and took her. She came to him, and he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. And the woman conceived, so she sent and told David and said, I am with child. Then David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. Then Uriah, or when Uriah had come to him, David asked how Joab was doing, and how the people were doing, and how the war prospered. And David said to Uriah, Go down to your house, wash your feet. So Uriah departed from the king's house, and a gift of food from the king followed him. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord, and did not go down to his own house. So when they told David, saying, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, Did you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go down to my house and eat and drink and lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. Then David said to Uriah, Wait here today also, and tomorrow I will let you depart. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. Now when David called him, he ate and drank before him, and he made him drunk. And at the evening he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of the Lord, but he did not go down to his house. In the morning it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter, saying, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, and retreat from him, that he may be struck down and die. So it was, while Joab besieged the city, he assigned Uriah to a place where he knew there were valiant men. Then the men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the people of the servants of David fell, and Uriah the Hittite died also. Then Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war, and charged the messenger, saying, When you have finished telling the matters of the war to the king, if it happens that the king's wrath arises, and he says to you, Why did you approach so near to the city when you fought? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall? Who struck Abimelech, the son of Jerubbesheth? Was it not a woman who cast a piece of millstone on him from the wall, so that he died in Thebes? Why did you go near the wall? Then you shall say, Your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So the messenger went and came and told David all that Joab had said to him. And the messenger said to David, Surely the men prevailed against us and came out to us in the field. We drove them back as far as the entrance of the gate. The archers shot from the wall at your servants. Some of the king's servants are dead, and your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Verse 25, Then David said to the messenger, thus you, thus you shall say to Joab, Do not let this thing displease you, for the sword devours one as well as another. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it. So encourage him. Then the wife, when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah her husband was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. God clearly knew what was happening. And verse 27 says something that we should take to heart. David's actions displeased God. We often read this account closer to the Passover. Let's continue in chapter 12. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said to him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had brought 
which he had bought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom, and it was like a daughter, a daughter to him. And a traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But instead, he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Verse 5, so David's anger was greatly aroused against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. And he shall restore fourfold the lamb because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan's parable about the lamb, which the man had stolen and slaughtered, really spoke to David. It really hit him hard because now in verse 7, God, through Nathan, has David right where he needs to be. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from the hands of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Notice now, you have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. God says here in verse 9 plainly, David had taken Uriah's life, he had taken his wife. I believe this clearly qualifies Uriah as a victim. Now, I have heard some in God's church say, well, Uriah may not have had the cleanest hands in the matter. I mean, here he was, home from battle, on furlough for a couple days. He had some other duties and obligations too. He had a wife at home whom he loved and who loved him. Had a little furlough time. Maybe it was appropriate for him to go home and, and, and see how the missus was doing, to let her know that he was still alive and well and cared about her. Well, I guess that's one way to think about it, but I believe the account that we've read here and the words from God make it pretty plain that God considered Uriah to be a victim. Notice what else God said in verse 10. Therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house. I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in, your wives in the sight of this son. You did this in secret, but I will do this thing before all Israel, before the son. God clearly saw David's actions as being wrong. They were clearly injurious to Uriah. And God took note. God remembered it. Verse 13. Now we come to the culmination that we often capitalize upon during the, the, the spring holy days. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And of course, David repented. It was subsequent to this that he wrote Psalm 51, the Psalm of Repentance, which we often review, again, at Passover and the days, the, the, the spring holy days. God saw Uriah as being a victim, and David as someone who took advantage of him, who wronged him. Let's go to the New Testament, and let's read some words from Jesus Christ. In Luke chapter 10, let's read one of the parables that Jesus gave us, which I believe also discusses a victim. It's one of the more famous parables. It's the Good Samaritan. 
in Luke 10, in verses 25 through 29, a lawyer is questioning Jesus about what he should be doing, what he needs to do to attain life. And Jesus said, you know, go to the scriptures. What do you need to do? And it comes to the point that, you know, this, this man, this lawyer asked, asked Jesus, you know, well, who, who, who is my neighbor? If I'm supposed to be good to my neighbor, who exactly is my neighbor? So let's, let's continue. Let's pick up the story here in Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 30, because this is where Jesus begins to tell the parable itself about the Good Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, verse 30, and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounding him and departing, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend... <clears throat> when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? Verse 37, the lawyer said, he who showed mercy on him. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Well, clearly here, Jesus took note of this victim, this victim who who fell into bad circumstance there and was abused, robbed, beaten by these bad thieves. But notice in verse 37, not only did Jesus take note, he also gave instruction to those that were listening. He said, now you go and do likewise. Not only does God take notice and remember the victim, but here Jesus plainly tells his followers they should do likewise. So when we see someone who's victimized and it's within our power to help and assist, it's nice if we can also be a good Samaritan and help when we can. We're not always in the position that we can. I see a lot of people beside the road with their hood up on their car. I try to pray for them, but usually I don't stop because I'm really not much of a mechanic. In the garden, I don't have a green thumb, and under the car hood, I really don't have a greasy thumb. But where we can help, God says we could. A victim is someone who suffers from a destructive or injurious action. But you know, it may not always be an intentional action like those that we have discussed so far. You know, someone like like Naboth or Uriah or this man that fell uh, among thieves going down to Jericho where someone deliberately and intentionally attacked them. Sometimes it may not be an intentional action that causes this injury. It may not always be something that's deliberately inflicted by a bad guy, a perpetrator. I'll tell you, I have had some bad luck with mailboxes. It's not been all that long ago, but I came out one morning and I saw my mailbox. It was a nice mailbox. It was heavy gauge metal. It had been attacked. I remember when I was a kid in school, I used to hear some of my classmates talk about taking a firecracker. They talked about an M80, I think they called it at the time. I see some nods out there. And they just throw it in a mailbox and close the lid and boom. Well, that's what happened to me because I saw the, the, the core of that little firecracker laying on the ground there. Ruined the mailbox. It's really disappointing. Another time, 
late in the afternoon one Sunday, it was summertime, looked out at the end of the driveway, someone had pulled in, didn't recognize the car. We live in the country, long driveway. Oh, nobody we knew. Person just pulled in the drive and backed out to go the other way. He was just turning around. Well, that's fine. I do that same sort of thing too. It wasn't until the next day when I went out and I saw he had backed over my mailbox post. Not intentional. Oh, the guy with the M80, I think that was on purpose. No doubt about that. Scott doesn't have those blinders on. But the guy that backed over the mailbox, I don't think he did that on purpose. But I was still left with the problem. We live in the country. We have at the northern part of our property another driveway. And there's a gate on that to, to keep people out. We don't really want anybody to go in there. A couple years ago, one night I got awake, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, and I heard a faint boom. We live in the country. We hear gunshots often, usually not in the middle of the night. And then maybe 15 seconds later, there was another boom. Looked out the window, didn't see anything. Next morning, some of the neighbors told me someone had stolen a pickup truck and apparently was out on a joyride, crashed through our gate, truck caught fire. Those booms, those were the two gas tanks blowing. Highway patrol was there, took care of things, all except the residue. You know, they towed away the, the wrecked truck. I was left with a lot of cleanup and a gate that oh, was just obliterated. They filed a, a, a police report. I, you know, I, uh, I saw that the, the truck had been stolen. I was able, though, to even contact the owner's insurance company. I was told, well, the truck was stolen, so there's no liability of the, you know, the owner nor its insurance company. Gate still closes. If you're ever out, you'll see that it's seen better days. I felt like I was a victim in that matter. I don't believe, though, that that person that was driving the truck, oh, I think he was driving the truck on purpose. I think he stole it on purpose. But I don't believe that he crashed it through my gate on purpose, um, that it caught fire and that sort of things. He was probably glad to get away with his life. I was still left with a broken gate but I don't think it was on purpose. Notice what else Jesus says along those lines. He doesn't talk about any gates, but he does talk about some towers. Turn with me, please, to Luke 13. We're going to read verses 1 through 5. Luke 13, starting in verse 1. There were present at that season some who told Jesus about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. You remember Pilate, that nice guy that was so nice to Jesus? Verse 2, And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Verse 4, or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Jesus cites these two examples here, and he says, these people really weren't any worse sinners than anybody else. It wasn't that they were being meted out punishment. It's not that they deserved to be punished for their, their sins more than anybody else, that that's why the tower fell on them. Jesus said, no, that's not the case. Have you ever known someone who views life through the filter or the lens of victimhood? You know, the latest issue of the Beyond Today magazine uh, on the cover has a picture of, of someone looking through a, a camera lens out on, you know, the, the, the landscape, the, uh, 
I think it's kind of rubble in a city. But, but that's the frame of reference. That's, that's how they view something. Have you ever known someone that looks at everything from the standpoint of a victim? Where just it seems that everything that occurs to this person, anything that's undesirable, that's unfortunate, that's unpleasant, unpleasant, this has just seemed to be further evidence that this person is always continually a victim. You know, kind of like the old country song that says, you know, if it weren't for bad luck, I'd have none at all. Have you ever known a person like that that just feels everything is just bad? Everyone is out to get this person. Everything bad happens to this person. Uh, brethren, we know there's no end to the troubles and trials and even tragedies that God's people face. I mean, you know, we hear continually about health problems. It, you know, tragic, it, it really is. People have job difficulties, dealing with difficult employers, difficult customers, difficult customers. People have car problems. Again, you see people broken down beside the road. Been there. I imagine some of you have been. Appliances that go on the, the, the blink. Washers, dryers, stoves. Anybody ever had any problems like that? And then dealing with insurance companies afterwards. Our freezer died before the feast. We've been on the phone and on the computer ever since. Sherry has spent so much time doing that. And it, it's supposed, we bought an extended warranty. It's supposed to be covered. And uh, yeah, well, that was scheduled for, oh, back, I think, last month. And, and then again, now this coming month. And it's been postponed again, but hopefully. And what about dealing with people? Anybody ever have any relatives who just seem to be kind of unreasonable? I hear young people say, oh, my parents just don't understand anything. And I hear parents say, oh, my children, I just don't know. Why do you believe Jesus could say so certainly that those 18 men crushed by that tower that fell on them in Siloam were no worse sinners than anyone else. Why do you suppose he just could say they died? They weren't being singled out for any special punishment, anything more or less than what they deserved. Well, I think Jesus knows, knew then, still knows today, of a verse found back in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 9, verse 11. Let's turn there. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 11. Because there's something written here is, that is very telltale. Verse 11 of chapter 9 in Ecclesiastes. I returned and saw under the sun, the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to the men of understanding, nor favor to men of skill, but time and chance happen to them all. Time and chance almost sounds like roll of the dice, luck of the draw. That's kind of how it is with time and chance because you can't really schedule something if it's, you know, well, just by chance. Years ago, I remember a member of God's church, not in this congregation, one time discussing with me, a group of us, this verse, and this, this, this gentleman said, I don't believe that affects, that doesn't apply to God's people, not in the church. Now, the rest of the world out there, yeah, I think they are subject to time and chance, but not God's people, because God is deeply involved in their lives. Everything that happens to them Nothing's going to happen by chance. Nothing is ever going to happen without God's interest, sanction, and approval. Time and chance, that's for other people, not God's people. And I thought at the time, I'm not so sure about that. But I did remember another verse from the Bible that says, 
a young man should not correct an older man. Don't contradict your elders. It's not respectful. And so I just held my peace. I didn't say anything. But I went away, and I thought about that. I meditated about it. I think I probably prayed and did a little study about that. And it came out, though, afterwards, and I thought, that man was wrong. No question about it. That man was wrong. This verse most definitely does apply to everyone, including God's people. Because, in effect, what that man was doing was calling God a liar. Now, I don't just mean on the face of the verse, because we know God's word is always perfect. I'm not just saying that on the face of the verse, if it says here that it affects all, that, well, you know, if that's what God's word says, then he would be wrong if, if he is segregating that and saying, this doesn't apply to my people. No, I'll show you another example about that. Do you remember that story I told you at the beginning of the sermon about the burglar that broke into our house? Remember? He came first when my family was at Camp Buckeye, but the second time we were journeying to the Feast of Tabernacles. Turn with me, please, to the book of Exodus, chapter 34. Exodus 34. In Exodus 34, we're going to start reading in verse 22. Just several scriptures here, if I can ever get my pages turned. Exodus 34, in verse 22, God says, You shall observe the feast of weeks, of the first fruits of wheat harvest, and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. Three times in the year all your men shall appear before the Lord, the Lord God of Israel. For I will cast out the nations before you and enlarge your borders. Well, we know about that three times a year. We hear that every year at the Holy Days. God tells us to go in these three seasons to the place where he has placed his name. Notice, though, continuing what else God says. Neither will any man covet your land when you go up to appear before the Lord your God three times in the year. Everybody's going to be gone. God says you, you take the whole family, you go to keep the holy days. Nobody's going to be back at the house standing guard. God says you don't have to worry about that because I'm going to do that. No one's going to covet your property or your goods. No one's going to try to come in and take them. God promises to protect our property when we go away to keep his holy days. And incidentally, the same thing happened to Sherry's parents years ago. The bad guy, burglar, he stole a VCR. So you know it has been quite a few years ago. Although, because VCRs aren't used too much anymore, but if you do have one, you might want to hang on to it because they're pretty hard to find anymore in the stores, and if you've got some old VCR tapes, um, videotapes, you know, stuck, stuck away in a closet and think, oh, I'd like to look at those once in a while, better hang on to that. But that's what happened to Sherry's parents. So the same thing happened to both of us. We were away at the feast. Somebody broke into our house. Well, wait a minute. God promised you go away to the holy days, no one's going to covet your property. But we went away, and somebody came in and coveted my little girl's piggy bank and their pressed penny collection. Well, those don't seem to match. I mean, maybe it's like the last time I stood here. Remember I talked to you about John the Baptist and said, you know, was he forgetful? Maybe God was forgetful. That doesn't sound very likely. Maybe Maybe God told a little fib here, you know? Um, you think that could be? Well, I think you know better than that, brethren. God doesn't do that. Turn with me, please, to the book of Titus, chapter 1. Titus, chapter 1. One verse only, verse 2. 
Titus chapter 1, verse 2. In hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie. Paul tells us here very plainly, God cannot lie. And notice what it says in Hebrews 6, verse 18. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18. By two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. Brethren, God doesn't lie. We know that. If he says in his word something, we can count on it. God's not going to pull the rug out from under us. He doesn't lie. So then, I'm still left with this conundrum here. How is it that no one was supposed to be coveting my property, and yet a burglar broke in and took it? We go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 11. God says, time and chance happen to all. All. That's all of us, brethren. All of us. But we should all always remember that God is always keenly aware and interested in what happens in the lives of his people. We know that. Brethren, every time we leave our house, we ask God to please protect it while we're gone. We don't take that for granted. Every time we get in the car, we ask the good Lord to please set his angels about us to protect us on the road. We pray that we won't have car trouble, that we won't have an accident. Those things happen. They happen to God's people. We hear about that. People have all sorts of problems. And so we do, we, hopefully all of us, we pray earnestly for God to protect and deliver and provide. And largely, I think that's very true that he does that, no question. Notice in Matthew chapter 10, verse 29, some more words here from Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 10, verses 29 to 31. Matthew 10, in verse 29, Jesus said, Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin, and not one of them falls to the ground apart from your Father's will? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. God is very concerned for his people. His eye is on his people. He is aware. Look back to Psalms chapter 116. Psalms 116. We're going to read just one verse here. Psalm 116 verse 15. We're told, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. No matter what happens to us, that happens to victims sometimes. Like, like, like Naboth, like Naboth like Uriah. God notes, God sees, and God considers very precious their death. When we do find ourselves to be the victims of someone else's deliberate, injurious actions, how should we react? Well, in Romans chapter 12, Paul gives us the answer. Romans chapter 12 we're going to read verses 19 through 21. Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 19. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. God says very plainly, vengeance belongs to him. God says, I will repay. God remembers victims. God's the one who retains the right to avenge us. It's not for us to do. Finally, let's go back to Ecclesiastes, this time to chapter 8. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 for our final verse today. 
our final passage. We're going to read verses 12 and 13. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verses 12 and 13. Though a sinner does evil a hundred times, and his days are prolonged, yet I surely know it will be well with those who fear God, who fear before him. But it will not be well with the wicked, nor will he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he does not fear God. Brethren, we want to be among those who fear God, those who trust that he loves us, that he cares for us, that he provides and protects us, and that in the end, things are going to work out for the best for God's people, those who seek to live as he instructs us. Sometimes, sadly, people, God's people, are victims, sometimes tragically so. But this never escapes God's notice, and it should not escape ours either. If we're able to help a victim in his distress, especially a fellow member in God's church, good. We've seen the example of the Good Samaritan. We should go and try to do likewise, as we have the power and ability and opportunity. And when we're victimized, deliberately or intentionally, we need not seek vengeance because God says that is his. That's not for us. But most of all, most importantly, we can all take comfort knowing that God remembers victims. God sees, God notices, God remembers.